Thank you everyone for joining us for this evening's event. I'm Emily, I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's. Um, just real quick before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already, please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Chanda Prescott Weinstein and Alyssa Washuda. Chanda is an assistant professor of physics and astronomy and core faculty in women's and gender studies at the University of New Hampshire. She is also a columnist for New Scientist and Physics World. Her research in theoretical physics focuses on cosmology, neutron stars, and dark matter, and she is active in Black feminist science, technology, and social studies. Essence Magazine recognized her as one of 15 Black women who are paving the way in STEM and breaking barriers. She has been profiled in several venues, including TechCrunch, Ms. Magazine, Huffington Post, Gizmodo, Nylon, and the African American Intellectual History Society's Black Perspectives. A co-founder of Particles for Justice Movement, she has received the 2017 LGBTQ Plus Physics Acknowledgement of Excellence Award for her contributions to improving conditions for marginalized people in physics, as well as the 2021 American Physical Society Edward A. Boucher Award for her contributions to particle cosmology. In the disordered cosmos, Dr. Prescott Weinstein shares her love for physics from the standard model of particle physics and what lies beyond it to the physics of melanin in the skin, to the latest theories of dark matter, all with a new spin informed by history, politics, and the wisdom of Star Trek. One of the leading physicists of her generation, Prescott Weinstein is also one of fewer than 100 Black American women to earn a PhD from a department of physics. Her vision of the cosmos is vibrant, buoyantly non-traditional, and grounded in Black feminist traditions. Joining her in conversation this evening is Alyssa Washuda, Washuda is a member of the Cowlitz Indian tribe and a nonfiction writer. She's the author of My Body is a Book of Rules and Starvation Mode, and her book White Magic is forthcoming from Tin House Books. With Teresa Warburton, she is co-editor of the anthology Shapes of Native Nonfiction, Collected Essays by Contemporary Women writer, by Contemporary Writers. She's a, nation, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship recipient, a Creative Capital Awardee, and an Assistant Professor of Creative Writing at The Ohio State University. So this evening's event will also include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you would like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. And perhaps most importantly, please consider supporting Chanda and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. We'll be sharing a link to buy the disordered cosmos as well as Alyssa's books in the chat a couple of times this evening. Um, Chanda, Alyssa, such a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. I'm so I want to start by shouting out the, the Powell's employees and the union at, at Powell's. Um, and also to remind folks that another way that you can support Powell's and Alyssa is by pre-ordering her book, White Magic, um, which I'm really excited about. It's a beautiful book. It's in the back. OK, I'm done advertising. Now I'm going to read to you all from The Disordered Cosmos. Um, so I'm going to read from the beginning of chapter 10, which is entitled Wages for Scientific Housework, which opens with an epigraph from a piece of writing by my grandmother. Where women are concerned, their labor appears to be a personal service outside of capital. Selma James, Sex, Race, and Class. In our stories of scientific genius, we don't talk about something that we all knew intuitively from a very young age. We do not function without food, without water. In reality, we are organic substances that require continuous sustenance. This is the biological outcome of the physical principle. There is no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. Energy that is dissipated has to be replaced. It also turns out that sanitation matters. Newton hid from the plague during what is known as his miracle year. Had the plague found him anyway, that miracle year would be nothing to speak of. We also believe that it matters that children are cared for and loved. We consider it a crime if they are neglected, even though it doesn't seem to be terribly criminal for police and vigilantes to shoot them if they are black. But in theory, raising children, including the children of scientists, is widely understood to be important. 
Thus, before Einstein's equation, before the detection of gravitational waves and neutron stars, comes sustenance, eating, the provision of eating, people who pick the food, feed the animals, slaughter the animals, people who deliver the food, cook the food, make sure we, we remember to eat it. And for all those pieces of paper we throw out, there are people who come to remove the mess, to ensure the office remains somewhat sanitary, people who scrub our toilets and mop our floors. Many of us, especially the cis men among us, have at points benefited from having someone at home whose full-time job is taking care of the cooking and in many cases, the raising of the children. Einstein was not unique. Many men in science were like him. Someone else raised their children. It was for the most part, not Einstein. Someone raised the children of the many men who got the world's largest gravitational wave observatory, LIGO, started. It was, for the most part, their wives. Many women continue to raise the children of the many men who are still working in science. Even if those women have jobs outside the home, data shows that they are still doing more of the work inside the home. We as a society don't talk too much about that, although the COVID-19 pandemic has forced some minimal discussion of it to the fore. We don't talk about the women at home making those Nobel Prizes and experiments and theories possible. The mothers and wives who kept sheets and clothing clean and did all the kid-related things so that their husbands could focus. We don't talk much about how this is work, and it is work that they are not paid for. We don't talk about the women who did the workplace version of this, the administrative assistants who typed up dissertations in the decades before their predominant scientific word processing software, LaTeX, came along. The admins who almost certainly often had to tolerate sexual harassment and sometimes sexual assault. They were certainly not paid enough and in many cases have been eliminated from the workplace. We don't talk about the poor and working class people, often immigrants, frequently of Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian heritage, who get paid below a living wage to keep the floors at universities and labs clean and the bathrooms tidy. Thank you for reading that. Um, I just want to say I love this book so much, Chanda. It's so, I'm so happy I have it here. Um, and it's so important to me. And um, I have a few questions for you, but before before we start, I just um, just wanted to tell you how much I loved it and how much it meant to me. And I want to show you my this little book I've had since I was a child. Um, I had that too. <laughs> I just you know, and I've been looking at it a lot recently. I loved this one. I loved. I mean, there's so many you know pages. It just opens right to um, because as a child, I was. Um, you know, really interested in the night sky. And um, my dad is a biologist and I figured I was gonna be a scientist um, and it didn't work out that way. And um, a lot of the things that you, um, that you wrote about as, as barriers to um, becoming what we want to be and kind of like moving into the unknowns that, um, that are most attractive to us. Um, it just resonated with me so much. And not that I have any regrets about, you know, becoming a um, creative writing professor in, instead of, um, you know, studying the night sky, but um, I just really loved all of the movements of this book from through, um, you know, opening with just the joy of, um, of knowledge and the joy of practicing your profession and um, the joy of learning and sharing it with us. Um, this really, I think you tweeted about this today. It really is a book for everybody. And um, and I'll you know I've, I'll touch on some of these things again later. But um, one of the things that I really loved the most was that. I didn't understand everything in the beginning. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't feel like I was going to, I, I couldn't pass a test. I, I couldn't pass a physics exam, um, but I knew I didn't need to. I knew that I was, I was in good hands. I was being taken care of. Um, 
And, you know, memorization was not the point. The point was to, you know, be along with you um, and to, you know, I, I have this book now, I can go back to it and I can, I can learn more another time. Um, and it's for me, even, even if I don't fully understand. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for that. It's just such a beautiful book. Um, thank you. So, yeah. Um, so I've got, I've got a few questions. Where are they? Um, one thing I wanted to talk about first, um, just as a person who's obsessed with book structure, I loved the way, as I said, it, the book opens with um, you sharing your passion with us and just this, it, you know, it starts in this place of curiosity, of wonder about the unknown, of delight about physics and the universe and the delight in sharing it. Um, and moves into you know some of the many challenges that are threats to your joy, um, and I was wondering if you um, would talk about just the experience of coming into the structure of this book and what your intentions were around it. Yeah, I love that question. I love being asked about form, so thank you. I I. I think I believe and understand more now on the other end of having written the book than I ever did, even when, you know, I was an editor, uh, that you find out what you think and what the story is from writing it down. So I went into it thinking that this book was going to be an essay collection that was going to be largely based on writing that I had already done online, like on my blog at Medium where if anybody's familiar with my writing, you'll see pieces of the stuff from Medium scattered throughout the book. I thought it was gonna be a much more coherent transfer than that. Even the physics of melanin, which um, is adapted from an essay that I wrote for Bitch Magazine. I would say that the chapter is very different because I had grown in my understanding of what, of the subject of melanin, and I had grown in my understanding of what needed to be said about it, what I thought needed to be said about it. And so, you know, in some ways, the book reflects like the proposal I put into my publisher. And in a lot of ways, this is a completely different book than, than the one that I thought I was writing. And, you know, in some ways, like the, the book told me about itself as, as I was working on it. Even I had an idea of what the chapter order would be. And then I would say like up through, I don't know, draft number three, like last summer, I was like, wait, no, this chapter needs to go in this order. And um, the book is broken into four different phases that are meant to kind of uh, analogize the, the four phases of matter. And that was not something I originally had planned. And then I realized that the book had this kind of rhythm to it that I start with what everybody agrees physics is. And then I continue into the tougher things that shape physics that sometimes people want to deny that those things are, are, are part of the doing of physics. And so when I first started writing the book, I never would have summarized it as a holistic look at the doing of particle physics and cosmology. But I think that that's what ended up happening. And I'm in, in many ways, in hindsight, it seems like obvious that I would want to write something that's like, okay, well, I don't want to just like glamorize physics for the general public. I want to tell the general public what physics actually is like. Um, so I, I think that that was a big piece of it is that I had to sit down and do it and then look at it and say, oh, so I actually think that the book should go in this order. Um, and I guess, you know, the last thing I'll say about that is that going into it, I had no idea how important to me it would be to foreground the science the way that I did. But I think now it makes perfect sense. Of course, I think it makes perfect sense that my book is in the order that it is. But just to kind of lay, lay that out for readers or people who are thinking about picking it up, I don't think that you can appreciate some of the points I'm making about politics and even, for example, wages for scientific work if you haven't first seen the artifice of science that I'm talking about. I'm, the particles that I'm talking about, the work that goes into it, my passion for it, I think it's very hard to appreciate the critique. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I agree. I think the, you know, I think the foregrounding of the science is, is really important and really effective. Um, and I think one thing that I especially loved about it um, was how present you were as a narrator inside of it and presenting it to us. And especially, um, you know, in part, just thinking about my own obsessions lately, I was really struck by how often you talked about the unknowns, the things that you're not sure of, um, the things that, you know, are unsettled in your discipline. And um, I, I really found those moments so fascinating, um, kind of identifying the limits of understanding um, that are sort of built into the, you know, the, the everyday work of what you do. Um, and, you know, being a creative writer, I mean, it's sort of all about the unknown uh, in my work. And, um, and, you know, I wasn't really, um, I just hadn't really thought about, about the role of the unknown in science. Um, and I appreciated that the, um, you know, you begin by talking about the wonder of the unknown and um, in a way that's so beautiful. And I think it, it is really important um, that you move into talking about um, and kind of other sides of the unknown. And um, maybe it's not another side, but the, um, the danger of, you know, people believing they know more than they do or, um, believe they um they know they know something and they really just don't know anything um you know like in the case of racism and um and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about I don't know your relationship with the unknown but specifically in this book and in the writing process and how you conceived of it yeah I think I definitely am always on a journey with this and I think that one of the mistakes that we make in the scientific community is that when we communicate to the public about science, that we do it on these terms that are so, I don't know if deterministic is the right word, but like we know the truth, these are the facts, that's the end of the conversation. And, you know, sometimes there are things that we understand pretty well. Um, we have a pretty good idea of like how gravity works in everyday life here on earth. We are, I, I think, right to be confident in that. Um, but the practice of science, the doing of science, doing particle physics is not actually memorizing things that are already known. That's important because it's a toolkit. It gives you a sense of, um, it gives you things to work with and an understanding of what is known about the world. But doing research in any discipline really is about working at the boundary of what is known and what has been thought about and what is unknown. So the work of a scientist is to exist intellectually exactly at that point of confusion. What, what are the things that we don't know and need answers to? And this is really structured into our profession in the sense that you can't complete a PhD if all you've done is read some textbook and, and take some classes your dissertation has to be an original contribution to the body of scientific knowledge, which means that you have done something that adds to our ability to do something, our ability to understand something, or an idea that might explain something that doesn't have a widely agreed upon explanation already. So science is about what we don't know. It's not actually about what we do know. Um, what we do know, first of all, sometimes ends up being disrupted and turns out to be entirely wrong. And uh, you know, in, in the passage that I read, I mentioned the, the first detection of gravitational waves, which is really recent. Like I think that announcement happened while I was working on the book proposal and in, in, I believe the year is 2017. And, um, you know, our theory of gravity, of everyday life gravity, 
there are no gravitational waves in that theory. And um, we've just celebrated the 100th anniversary of Einstein's general relativity, which predicts these gravitational waves. So even the thing that is approximately correct in our everyday life isn't necessarily correct in all, on all scales and um, in all parts of what we would call parameter space, like different um, speeds, different mass scales, the things that apply on the scale of you know, the mass of a human are very different considerations than on the scale of the mass of a neutrino or even a neutron, right? And I think that's a very different way of thinking about science than the way that we communicate to the public about it. And so again, I, I think I wanted people to walk away going, oh, this is a little bit messy. Not because I don't want people to believe like that global warming is real because there's this like overwhelming evidence for that, right? So I think it's also a fine line to walk, particularly in this political environment. Uh, and, you know, I had already written uh, two drafts of the book by the time the pandemic took off. And so I had no idea that I was gonna be, the book was gonna be coming out in the midst of this very public conversation about science and the impact that it has on everyday life everybody's lives. Um, so I, I, I wanted to say that, and I just want to acknowledge also that so much of my understanding of the idea of known and unknown in physics and astronomy was reconfigured by um, Kanaka Meoli, um, resistance to the building, um, Native Hawaiian resistance to the building of the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Um, because the stories that astronomers were telling about Native Hawaiians I, were first of all, often grotesque, um, but pointed to a lack of curiosity that was totally, like the story was completely dissonant with my experience when I actually went to talk to the kiai, the, the protectors, as they were known, they're not called protesters, they're protectors. People had all kinds of astronomy questions for me and people, astronomers kept saying like, oh, you know, it's science versus religion. But then when I actually went and had conversations with people, people were actually deeply curious about why the instrument meant so much to astronomers. And I didn't see that same kind of curiosity from astronomers about why the Mauna meant so much to the Kiai. Um, and that was a real crisis moment for me in 2015, going through that experience that I had to really think, what is what kind of scientist am I going to be? Can I be a scientist if this is what me, being a scientist means? And so I think I had to really rethink curiosity and confidence and humility and knowing and not knowing and um, being okay with being confused and unsure. I remember when that was happening and um, reading your tweets about, about what was happening was so useful because I didn't understand what the telescope meant, you know? Um, and I mean, I was struck then and struck in this book by um, just your, um, the respect for other beings that comes through. Um, and that's part of that, that curiosity and that um, respect for the unknown. Um, I really appreciated that. Um, and, yeah, I wanted to touch on something you just said. I think it's, um, you know, I I think it is so useful for, um, you know, the general public, those of us who aren't scientists, to see that process of being, you know, in uncertainty and in process as a normal part of process. Um, you know, just thinking about the pandemic and early on, people trying to kind of like figure out on their own how to, you know, like, what is a preprint? Um, like, what are, you know, what, what is all this information? How do we know, um, you know, what we're reading and um, whether it's, you know, settled science or not? Um, so I think the kind of your writing you're doing is really, um, really important in, in kind of like setting up, um, just letting people into that structure of, of knowledge acquisition. Um, another thing I wanted to I wanted to ask about, or I don't know if there's much of a question here, but more of a more of a comment than a question. Um, but you talked um, a little while ago about 
um, how some of these chapters were pub pre previously published. And um, I really enjoyed the way um, you revisited and, and retooled um, the physics of melanin after I had read it in Bitch Magazine. Um, that wasn't, that was the one in Bitch Magazine, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I noticed, um, or I, I saw that you, you know, spoke to the effect uh, that, you know, that published piece had. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And I, I was wondering um, if you could share something about your process of, of kind of revisiting these, these pieces and thinking about their impact and how that's a part of this book too. I will say the two chapters that I struggled with the most were the anti-patriarchy agender and the physics of melanin. And the physics of melanin was the one that probably got the most revision, ironically, right? Because it was the one where I was really working with something where I could have just like cut and pasted it. I had permission from bitch. I could have just cut and pasted it and like, you know, filled it out a little bit to, to, to lengthen it a little bit and then been like, I'm done. Um, but actually that was the one that I was revising it right up until the point where they were like, you can no longer make big edits because we're paginating and doing an index and you can only change like little words. <laughs> but even like when I returned my responses to the copy edits, I had revised the beginning of the chapter significantly and I had reorganized chapters. Um, the physics of melanin started out as I really wanted to say, like, let's talk about color, but let's talk about, um, I wanted, I don't, I don't think I was articulating it at the time, but I wanted to do this Afrofuturist thing where I said, like, here's a thing about blackness that is science and blackness, but not about abuse and, and blackness and science which so many of our stories about the experiences of Black people in science are in one way, they're either triumph over abuse and racism, or they are victim of abuse and racism, or um, like those are, I guess those are basically like the two options traditionally, right? And I wanted to, to think through um, like how, what is the physics of the way that color works in our skin? So that was my original motivation for it. And then I think that when I came back to it for the book, I was thinking so much more about race science and the way that race science has been present in the conversations that we're having with each other. And I don't just mean like, you know, good old, like traditional Nazi-esque white eugenicists. But even actually the way that race science affects the way that we as um, like black and indigenous folks deal with our own. Um, and I wanted to attend to that in a kind of way. I wanted to attend to the history. And, and I think the other thing is, is that I realized that I hadn't spent a lot of time in the original essay, like learning more about like what was the trajectory of people trying to understand melanin as a, as a physical phenomenon. And in the process of doing that, I had to kind of like reckon with the, the racism of like, you can find like scientific papers that were published within the last 20 years that use like mongoloid and negroid and, and these kinds of like, like I was stunned. I, I have to say like, I shouldn't be stunned by something like that, but I was like, wow. Um, people really just have like no standards <laughs> whatsoever um, at the peer, these were peer reviewed works of, of scientific literature. Um, but even like the story of the, the first time that someone figured out that there's a layer of like clear derma on top and then there's melanin underneath it. And um, this involved an experiment involving a, a black person in the 18th century. And I was unable to figure out from the literature if the black person was alive or a cadaver when the experiment was done, when the skin was peeled off. Oh my God. Right. And so realizing that there is also, I, I don't know, in the end, I don't know, maybe I sort of failed in that. Like I have the story and now it really is in part like about abuse and harm. And 
I realized that this was the point at which I had to think through what is the definition of race and what is the definition of racism. And I want to shout out like Shay Akil McLean, who's like a truly brilliant um, I thinker who just finished their PhD last year um, for putting out scholarship that really like made me rethink that. But I think it maintains the heart of the original and that like the landing place that I go is still like melanin, melanin's fucking awesome. <laughs> So I think I still land that place, but I think that that was an example of, I really struggled with, even at some point I sent a draft to my editor who was fantastic. And she was like, you know, this was originally a science chapter. And now it seems like it's, it's less of a physical science and more of a social science chapter. And so there was this constant, I really feel like, um, you know, if I was going to like reference Jeanette Winterson here, like it was a written on the body moment, right? that it was really, I see Joe Osmondson, no. <laughs> my dear friend in the chat, why not both? I really think that that was part of it, was realizing it was written in the body, but wanting to be careful about like not being pessimistic about that and not saying that our pain is forever built into us. Um, so I was really, I was stretched. That was really long, I was stretched. <laughs> well, that like, um brings to mind something I wanted to talk to you about anyway. Um, as I told you over email, I, um, you know, at, at several points while reading this book, I was thinking about my colleague, Caritha Mitchell's um, article, Identifying White Mediocrity and Know Your Place Aggression, a Form of Self-Care. Um, I highlighted some I highlighted something, let me look. Um, God, I loved that article the first time I read it. It's just so good. sheer brilliance. <laughs> Um, okay, so she writes, I urge cultural critics to adopt reading practices that center success and recognize that marginalized groups pursue their definitions of success much more than they respond to the violence they encounter. Violence pursues them because they accumulate achievements and American culture is designed to remind everyone that accomplishment is meant for straight white men. Um, I mean that, you know, she, she has violence pursues them in italics, like the emphasis of that, um, you know, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it, but it, I mean, it's so, it's so true. And I, I'm thinking of that as you're, as you're talking about, um, you know, what, um, you know, what you kind of, I think you said you kind of wanted to avoid in, in coming to revision of this chapter, um, but that violence, um, you know, I think is, is sort of um, clinging on to, you know, some of these, these conversations. Um, what else did I want to ask about that? I think, um, yeah, I think we just have a, a few minutes before we'll go to the, the Q&A, but um, I did want to talk a little bit about Know Your Place Aggression and um, didn't want to finish our conversation with, without talking about academia, since we are both assistant <laughs> professors. And um, Ooh, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what there is to say about it. Um, but, you know, I, I really, um, you know, what you, what you wrote in the chapter that you read from um, and to other places really resonated with me as someone in a completely different discipline. Um, just this, um, I think you really spoke to some really important things about um, just academic work and, um, and, you know, how that is part of the work, all of the other stuff that is not our research and creative expression. Um, I guess I'm just wondering about how, um, I guess sort of in a narrative sense as you were, um, I really um, kind of want to fold in something else I was thinking about as you were talking. I really, so I had a hard time, I had the hardest time in, in writing White Magic with the, the essays that were already published or with one of them anyway because of that revision of something that is, is done. Um, I think, I mean, at least for me, it was because I really, and I, I sense that this was probably the case for you too. Um, you know, I really was showing up to it with real lived stakes 
you know, like an authentic, um, it was an authentic actual exploration of going into the unknown and not knowing what I was going to find, um, you know, coming through it and by doing the work of, of interrogating these things about my life. Um, and so to have to, you know, work in a piece from the past into the present um, was a real challenge. Um, but anyway, that's a digression. I, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering if you um, want to speak to any, anything about, um, I don't know, the process of, of writing about work and life while working and living and, you know, writing about something that's an ongoing struggle. Yeah, I, so I think Caritha's scholarship, and in particular, actually, like, you know, that article is kind of a taster for the book that she just put out from Slave Cabins to the White House. Um, I can't, the subtitle is escaping my mind right now, but it's it's a book I highly recommend. And the, the introduction is just like so bold and this idea of know your place aggression. Um, so she talks about know your place aggression in like, you know, our everyday lives. The, and, and, and it's very easy for us to access that like, you know, people see you out there being successful, doing well, and they're like, you need to go back into your place. And so there's this like sometimes violent, particularly as we've been seeing increasing in the last couple of years and, and like the terrible thing that happened in Atlanta last night. Um, that know your place aggression is like this violent, like go back, know your place. Um, her hypothesis in the book, which I think is just incredibly bold, is that this is a phenomenon that isn't just like, well, now that in theory, like people of color are free to do whatever they want, um, that like people are upset about it, but that this has actually been the problem the entire time, that every time like um, Black people started to, you know, um, find ways to be their full human selves, that like white supremacists got upset about it, and that so much of um, it, it's like this radi it's like this incredibly like refreshing um reorientation of how do we read American history um and and she focuses because this is you know her field particularly on on black experiences but I actually think that it's a rich theory that could say a lot about how do we reinterpret an anti-indigeneity and um treaty violations and and, and all of these things right um, I think each community could find a, a discourse in there. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about, about writing about work um, is realizing, is, is grappling with the way that hierarchies are constructed and the ways in which I am located in different places in the hierarchies and in different contexts. And so just to make a comment about the physics of melanin, like one of the things that I did feel like I had to go back and revise, surprisingly, actually, nobody, at least to my face, critiqued me about this, but I don't think that I spent enough time addressing colorism in kind of the nuanced way that it needed to be addressed um, in, in a way that like confronts like the biologization of race in some of our discourses about colorism and what the function of colorism is, which is to... Um, uphold white supremacy and empower white supremacy by stratifying, right? And I actually don't see it as being any different in these workplace environments that like even the other day, I said something, I was on a call with people who were administrative staff somewhere and I said, you know, I wanna be really clear that I understand like the administrative staff are really essential to this project. And, you know, the janitors are really essential to this project. And they were on board until I said janitors. And then there was this moment where somebody, everybody texted me and they were like, Chanda, did you see what happened when you said janitors? Someone's eyebrows raised up, like, how dare you class me with the janitors, right? And so I think that there are ways in which like we are all being challenged. I am, even those of us who see ourselves as like principled, you know, we have reclaimed the social justice warrior moniker. <laughs> Um, that even we have to unpack not just the, the complicated social locations that we find ourselves in and work in the labor frame is a really useful way of thinking that through, 
but also that we have to be really cautious in the stories that we tell as we try and challenge these hierarchies. Um, and so I hope what comes through, I know we have to, we, we should go to the Q&A, but I hope that what, what comes through is that solidarity is the way that we get through this. And so um, even as we recognize that our needs and histories are different and we are coming to the conversation in different ways, that finding ways to be in mutual solidarity. And so I talk about mutual aid in the book and that's kind of where the book lands. Um, that it's okay to acknowledge that we are not identical and that is not a threat to solidarity. And I think sometimes that piece is lost that people think that in order to recognize our unique experiences with pain um, and our unique experiences with envisioning the future, that that means we can't be in solidarity with each other. And I, I think that that's how white supremacist heterosis patriarchy wins is by us continuing to believe that. So I think that these conversations about work are in some sense about that. And they're also risky to have as an assistant professor. So I just wanna acknowledge that piece of what you said before we move on that, um, you know, I'm saying things that, you know, people might read this and say, well, fuck her, she's not getting tenure. <laughs> oh, I hope not, <laughs> but um, I mean, you know, as long as I've been in my job, um, my conversations I've had with you about these things have really stayed with me and helped me like remember who I am in the job. Um, so I just wanted to say that before we move to Q&A, we've got some questions. I'm trying to figure out how to do a heart. There we go. My little heart. <laughs> Where are the emojis? Um, okay. Sorry, I need, a, I need a second to look at these. Um, can, I, can I pick a question? Please, yes. Um, okay, so I want to answer Corey Gray's question because um, Corey is awesome and he mentioned moms and so moms deserve a mention. So he asks, your book ends with the chapter, Dear Mama, this is what my freedom dream looks like. I bought disordered cosmos for my mom. How should I describe the book to her? Should she read the Dear Mama chapter first or jump right into it? Yeah, so I will say that I am interested in the idea of reading the book in a disordered way. It is called The Disordered Cosmos. Um, there are ways in which the, the, the chapters build on each other. And so I think that that was the experience that I was thinking about. It is also the case that an excerpt from the Dear Mama chapter um, was published in Essence magazine in the January, February issue and is available for free online for anybody who wants, wants to have a look at it. So I think that there was already kind of a, a, a reveal of that. So I think it, you know, maybe your mama, Corey, might feel like more invested in the rest of the story if she knows that this is, if this is the landing place, particularly if you feel that she can maybe connect with the story that I tell there about my mom and the role that she played for me. Um, if you do read it in a disordered way, I wanna hear about it. I wanna hear what your experience with that was. Um, does um, another one of these jump out at you or should I pick one? I'll just say hi to Kenny. He's one of my oldest black physicist friends and just said hi in the chat. Um, how about Daryl Reano's um, question? Yeah, I'll read this. Okay. Thank you for sharing your writing. My question is about something you talk about in the chapter, space time isn't straight. Quote, intuition about space and time isn't universal and that it has cultural and experiential context. Can you share more about your perspective on multiple ways of knowing and their ability to transform how we understand science and the scientific process? Yeah, so I think this is a really important question because I think one of the challenges with, with this book is that I, because it's so unusual and maybe one of the first books that is articulated as a popular science book, but also grapples with blackness and indigeneity at the same time, that I think people were hoping, some people were hoping that there would be more um, about uh, indigenous ways of knowing. And, and I just wanna say, when I say indigenous here, like I'm, I mean, broadly, like including folks in Africa, including folks in the Pacific islands. Um, and so, 
I guess like I'll say a couple of things, which is that I consider myself to be very much like a beginner. Um, because of the, the educational structures that I came up in and the context in which I came up, the thing that I know best is professionalized physics that is um, that has in many ways come through the post enlightenment intellectual thread, even though along the way we can point to ways in which people outside of that framework have made contributions. Um, and in particular, you know, one of the things that I had to have care with in this book is that I talk with with some at some length about Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiian um, viewpoints and experiences. And I knew that this was going to be one of the first like um, trade books that addressed Mauna Kea and the 30 meter telescope issue. And I wanted to be really, really careful about not being like, and now I, as an outsider to the community, I'm going to introduce you into the Kanaka Maoli way of seeing the world. Um, and so um, what I did is I, I, I pointed to some things that I had learned about, that I had heard about, I articulated myself as a beginner and I said, I found these things interesting and I found these things useful and I'm learning and continue to be in conversation with Kanaka Maoli um, thinkers about these ideas. Um, so my book doesn't do that like, okay, here's another way we can think of um, quantum mechanics, uh, like uh, Leroy Little Bear, for example. I'm not sure that's my ministry, at least not at this point in time, but my hope is that the book opens the door so that when that person for whom that is their ministry, that is their positionality, that is the nature of their intellectual joy and curiosity, that it becomes that much easier for them to find the space, time, and the resources to be allowed to do that work and share it with the world. And I think that was the goal with the book, was not so much to, to tell people, um, you know, here's another way of seeing things, but to say there are other ways of seeing things and we need to respect those paths and those pathways and, and have those conversations. So I don't know if I achieved it, but I felt like humility was a very important thing there because even um, one of the things I talk about with grief in the book um, is I don't know what my indigenous communities are. I am, that is part of the violence of slavery is that I don't know what my, my mother's families, indigenous communities are. And so I will never be able to go and say, okay, I'm, I'm becoming an expert in my own like in indigenous um, ways of, of thinking about the world. And I think that, that there's a lot of grief in that. And then, you know, there's, there's the Afrofuturist vision of that, which is that um, I can be in solidarity and in conversation. And, and try to craft something with other members of my community. I love that. I think that absolutely came through. Thank uh, you. Natasha asks, I wondered if you could talk about the balance between holding space for uncertainty and the scientific drive to know as much as possible. Yeah, I think here is another place where I learned a lot from um, Kanaka folks and I, I want to name in particular Wahikea Maile, who is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto now. Um, I think it would be fair to say he's one of the Kia'i um, who has written about the idea of colonial time in relation to the 30 meter telescope and in relation to the rush to, to do these projects. Um, and that was one of the conversations that I was having with the Kiai when um, people were asking me these questions. They were like, okay, so I think I understand, like people want a really big telescope. They want it to be in the Northern hemisphere. The Mauna has really good seeing. I understand some of the technical arguments for this. Um, I get like the pictures, you all love the pictures. I love the pictures. Everybody was in agreement. The images of the universe are awesome. I don't think there was ever like, you know, there was this weird thing that happened in the media that was like, I mean, I think folks are used to being set up as straw men in the media. So like, who's surprised by that, I guess. Um, but the question of, does it have to happen now? Does it have to, do we have to start building it in 2015? 
I'm, I, th I think that there's a real, so there are some people and I think Oahikea would be one of them and maybe he's in the audience actually. So shout out if, if you are there. Um, that the telescope should never be built. And I don't think actually it's entirely my place to say like, I don't have a vote in that. I'm not Kanaka. Um, but I also think that scientists were very intent on the decision about whether the telescope was going to be built happening on their timeline and not on the timeline of allowing Kanaka Meoli to, um, to develop a way of making the decision inside the community in whatever process makes sense for their community and on whatever timeline makes sense for their community. So the one thing I can say, hey, okay. hey what's up? Um, so the one thing that I can say is like that as an outsider, as a scientist, as an astronomer in the community, I know that colonial time means we got to do it now, we got to do it on our schedule. And what does our schedule mean? Just coming back to the comment about us being assistant professors. There are people who need this project to happen because their tenure is writing on it, their grant money is writing on it, their um, institutional resources are writing on it. That has nothing to do with does the sky look the same in 30 years? And that's about the time scale of my professional success. That's not about wondering in the universe. That's about capital, that's our capitalism entering into the conversation. Um, I will always wonder, is there a scenario where people given adequate time and the right context and the right self-determination in the conversation, people might have come to the conclusion in a process that I was totally um, uh, respectful to um, Kanaka Meoli tradition, where they would have said, yes, we've decided that this is consistent with our traditions and we now this is consistent with who we are now to do this. That might have taken 30 years to happen and maybe never. And I, I guess the other thing I wanna say is that scientists were not prepared for the answer to be no. <laughs> like we have, to, we have to be prepared for the possibility that sometimes someone's gonna say no to us. Um, and consent doesn't mean I'm waiting for you to figure out how you're going to say yes to me. Consent means that sometimes people say no. And that's the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Scientists are not used to that. And, and sometimes that persistence serves us well. I wouldn't be where I was or where I am if I were not a persistent person. Um, but there's a difference between being persistent with a physics problem and treating indigenous um, livelihoods into a physics problem to be solved as opposed to a community of people um, who share our humanity and are to be respected. Hmm. We probably have time for one more question. Do you wanna, do you wanna pick one? Um, maybe I'll respond to, to Meredith's question. Hi, Meredith. Um, I did, do you wanna read it or should I read it? Oh yeah, I'll <laughs> oh. read it, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah thinking about your last answer. Um, <laughs> You've written about how the night sky is important to you personally and important to humanity and many cultures in a larger sense. What are your thoughts on a future with tens of thousands of low earth orbit satellite constellations? So I appreciate Meredith as, as a member of the professional community asking this question. Um, because I think that's something we need to be really aware of is that right now the night sky, you know, when we were having the debate about the 30 meter telescope, I'm in public for the first time in 2015, everybody was like, well, why don't you just like put it up in, in the sky? And, you know, there are technical reasons why that, like that, that's actually difficult. And there are reasons why you still wanna do things on the ground. What we didn't see coming in that moment was actually that like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos were gonna be launching like tens of thousands of satellites into the sky that have actually made it so that, for example, the Vera Rubin Observatory, um, a collaboration that I'm a part of that's being built in the Atacama Desert, Atacama Desert in, in Chile, um, now actually has to reconfigure our observing plan and our computational pipeline um, because there are so many of these satellites that they're disrupting what the sky looks like. Um, they're um, littering our images and they're, um, they're not exactly space litter, but they're they're bound they're borderline space litter. Um, there's very little regulation of this, and 
I guess the comment that I want to make is that it's sort of terrifying for me, but it continues to be the case that it's such a small number of people can make such a huge decision um, for the rest of humanity. I mean, for me, it was already shocking that people were like, yeah, we're going to put a hole in the Mauna and the Mauna will never be the same after we put this giant hole in it. And I was like, how can you guys not feel the depth of that? Particularly, um, you know, just to come back to Daryl's question, um, one of the things that I learned about Kanaka ways of understanding the world is that the land is, is thought of as a family member. And I just keep thinking, would we be in this global warming situation if everybody had understand that the, understood that the land was a family member? I'm, I'm now finding myself wondering, are we in a situation where we're getting really screwed up because we didn't understand the sky was a family member too? Um, that the sky we have evolved under is being changed for us by just a couple of people who have like enough money to make those decisions without our permission. And now it doesn't just affect like people in one piece of land or in one community, but everybody who looks at the night sky, that like the next generation will look at the sky and they will not be able to see the sky that their ancestors saw. And that is profound when you think about how long we have evolved under this night sky. I remember, you know, I don't think I would have known about it. I would have known about it eventually, but I don't think I would have known about that if not for your tweets and Sarah Tuttle's tweets. And it's just wild to me that, you know, that I think I told somebody at the time and they had no idea um, what a, you know, profound change to just be part of the way things are done now because it's we're so used to Jeff Bezos running the world. Um, so, you know, in such a short time, we've, you know, like been forced to accept this. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of, you know, the sky, like, I mean, even being an entity rather than just a void where, um, you know, things can go to, I don't, I don't know what the satellites even do. <laughs> can yeah. I, can I just like rip off of that for, I know we're, we need to wrap up, but I think like the one comment I want to make about that, just returning to other ways of knowing, which is that in so many ways, the idea that the sky is part of our community is built into so many different cosmologies. And the kind of cosmology that I do is really, I think the only one that I can think of that it's not written into that cosmology. And I wonder what we are losing as, a, as, as, as Sylvia Winter articulates us as a storytelling species when we, we don't recognize that piece. And I'm, so I guess I can say like I have in, inadvertently started to introduce some of these ideas into the way that I do science and it has nothing to do with like changing the laws of gravity or anything like that, but rethinking why all of these pieces of my scientific work are important and why they speak to me as a person, as a human being. Thank you so much for um, answering all of our questions. And um, I don't know exactly how we're wrapping this up other than, um, I think this is, if I put up the book, it's backwards, isn't it? But- um, I can see it, I can see it. You're okay. good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's such a beautiful book. I hope everybody will buy a copy from Powell's. Um, if you already have a copy that's not from Powell's, get another copy and give it to a friend or a family, family member. Um, and white magic. White magic is coming. Thank you. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you both so much for being here. It was such a pleasure to welcome you. And that was an amazing conversation. Um, I want to thank everyone out there for joining us. We will be putting this event up on YouTube uh, later this week. So if you would like to share it or watch it again, it will be online. Um, and please do check out our lineup of other upcoming events and uh, do consider purchasing a copy of both of their books online at pals.com. Um, we hope to see you at another event soon. And until then, just take care and have a wonderful night. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Thank, Thank you. you.